Welcome to Jews in the South, a series of programs exploring the history and culture of Jewish life in the South through field trips and lectures with Georgia State University's Jewish Studies program. This is part two of a presentation by historian Sandy Berman on the notorious Leo Frank case that gripped Atlanta and beyond in the early part of the 20th century. In the previous episode, Berman shares the story of Frank's conviction for the murder of Mary Fagan, an employee at the National Pencil Company, where Frank was a superintendent, and the subsequent coverage of the case by the national news media. So what happens now um, is that because of all this national interest, national support, national outcry, I mean, it is in papers across the country that the wrong man is being um, held for this crime, that. Uh, what it does is make this individual extremely angry. And if you've all gone by the Capitol, and I'm sure going, by, going to school at Georgia State, you've seen the statue of Tom Watson outside the Capitol. Tom Watson began his career as a populist, an agrarian reformer. But as the years went on, he, he was also extremely anti-Catholic. And he started to write or publish a newspaper called The Jeffersonian. That's one of the issues. Um, that was really very, very anti-Catholic. Every issue was the Catholics are doing, you know, the Pope conspiracy, all of, all of that. Um, but he was also mortal enemies with the owner and publisher of the Atlanta Journal, whose name was Hoke Smith. They hated each other. And by 1914, Hoke Smith and the owner of the journal is thinking, maybe Leo Frank really didn't get a fair trial. And he's starting to put articles in the journal that are saying, you know, maybe this man deserves another chance. This angers Tom Watson so much that he stops his anti-Catholic tirades in the Jeffersonian and every single issue of the Jeffersonian. And we were able to find the entire year of original copies of the Jeffersonian for the collection um, is dedicated to Leo Frank. So here we have the Leo Frank case. Does the state of Georgia deserve this nationwide abuse? Talking about how everybody across the country is saying, that Georgia didn't give Leo Frank a fair trial, um, and every issue. And he actually, at one point, calls in one of his newspapers for the lynching of Leo Frank. William Smith, Frank um, Conley's attorney. At this point in time, after he truly gets, um, helps Conley beat the charges, helps him get off on a misdemeanor. And he's, he's lived and worked with Conley for, for a year. And he knows him inside and out. He, he firmly believes in his own mind that Conley is guilty, that he's the one who killed Mary Fagan and Leo Frank was innocent. So he goes to the newspaper, and he's really one of the unsung heroes in this whole mess because he's a prominent attorney and he always took cases for the underdog, which is why he took Conley on as a client. He thought, rightly so, that in 1913, Georgia, a black man was not going to get a fair shake. So he takes him on as a client. At that point in time, when he takes him on, firmly believing that he's innocent. But the more he gets to know Conley, the more he gets to understand him, he realizes that, uh-uh, he's not innocent. He's probably guilty. He goes to Hugh Dorsey, who doesn't want to do anything at this point. He's not going to jeopardize his own political career for the sake uh, of overturning a conviction that he worked so hard to get. And what, what this does to William Smith is that it destroys his entire career. He ends up having to, he purchases a gun to protect himself and his family. He is so fearful of his own life, he leaves the state of Georgia, never returns until he retires. He doesn't work as an attorney again for 
probably 20 years, but spends the rest of his life trying to prove to everybody that Leo Frank was innocent. And his grandson, Charlie Smith, gave us this note um, that was found in an, one of the, um, in some of the research notes that William Smith um, had put together. And William Smith died of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, in 1949, and he wrote on this note, in Articles of Death, I believe in the innocence and good character of Leo M. Frank, William Smith. So th that's going on with William Smith. They're still trying to prove in the appeals, um, which is going to, all the way to the Supreme Court, that Leo Frank is innocent. And Henry Alexander comes on the scene. Now, I know all of you have shopped at Phipps Plaza at one time or another, right? If you go into Phipps Plaza and you cross that little bridge over it on either side of the street, you will see two little pillars and they say Henry Alexander Square. Because the Alexander family um, go all the way back in, Atlanta, to, in Georgia to the Revolutionary War. They were an old, old Sephardic, uh, actually they weren't, part of their family is Sephardic, part of it was Ashkenazi, but they go back to the Revolutionary War. 24 members of the Alexander family fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. Um, and Cecil Alexander just recently passed away. I don't know if you saw any of that in, in the newspaper. He was a, very involved in the Civil Rights um, Movement. And anyway, Henry Alexander, he's a young Atlanta attorney. He comes on to help in the appeals phase of the Frank case, and he decides to analyze the murder notes. So that we're lucky again because the originals don't exist, but Alexander reproduced them in pamphlet form. And because we have all, the Bremen has all of Henry Alexander's papers, we have about 50 copies of the murder note pamphlet because he saved them all. Um, but he took the notes and he, and he reanalyzed them and saying basically that a white, northern, educate, Cornell educated man would not know any of the colloquialisms that were in the murder notes. And, um, and that the night watch, where he says night witch, which people thought was the night watchman, it's actually a night witch, which was a superstition. Um, so um, he tries to prove, again, that Leo Frank is innocent based on the murder notes that were left at the body. Um, William J. Burns, who was, by his own advertisement, America's most successful detective, our most notorious, or not notorious, the most well-known detective, comes down to try to prove Frank's innocence. Um, again, nothing much happens. But then um, Adolf Ox, again of the New York Times, decides to do one better. He hires an, a, 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 a Spanish-American war veteran by the name of um, James Perry Fife to come down and actually do a thorough investigation of the case. So he decides to reenact the crime. And these are the most unbelievable photographs, which again, we found in New York in, at the New York Times. And no one, not even Steve Oney, who wrote um, And the Dead Shall Rise, which is an 800-page book on the case, knew that these existed. And then once we published these, we got a call from the state archives and said, we have a set of these pictures in Governor Slayton's papers, and we never knew what they were. Because our, ours had the actual descriptions on the bottom. So you can see they were attached. So this one says, the ladder broke the fall. And um, so these were reenactments of the crime. And again, they're showing that um, according to the prosecution, the body was thrown down, um, was used on the elevator. According to the defense, the body was thrown down the coal chute. Um, and this does become important when Governor Slayton reviews the case. And that's what the defense is trying to show in these reenactment pictures, that the elevator was not used, that Mary Fagan's body was thrown down the coal chute and landed in the basement. And also, by this point in time, Leo Frank himself is taking a much more active role in his own defense, and he writes in prison a series of leaflets. He writes them out in longhand, and Lucille, his wife, types them up 
every night and disseminates them throughout the city. And again, the Bremen is fortunate to have almost a complete set of the leaflets that Leo Frank wrote in prison, and this is one example. So it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. The appeal is denied. Um, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, writes his most famous dissent, and the now case now rests, the, Leo Frank's only chance rests in the hands of the then governor, um, Dor John M. Slayton. Slayton is due to retire, uh, leave office in just a few weeks. He could have left it up to the next governor, but he decides to go ahead and review the appeals. Um, the, his opponents say it was because he was in the same law firm as Luther Rosser, and other advocates or, or people in pro Slayton say it was because he was a, a, an honorable man. And in the 1960s, I think it was, um, one of the television stations did a whole series of called Profiles in Courage, and one was of John F. Kennedy, and Governor Slayton was profiled in that series for his courageous stance because he, again, destroyed his entire career. Never again ran for political office and really had left town for a while. But he decides to review all the evidence. So he takes all of the evidence, which is why those photographs end up in Slayton's papers. And he goes back to the pencil factory um, a couple times, actually. And what he discovers is that in the police department statements, when they originally went down the elevator to see Mary Fagan's body. They took the elevator. Jim Conley had um, testified or said that he defecated at the bottom of the elevator shaft when he took the body, when he took the elevator down, um, or, the, or the morning of the murder. That's what he said. And when the police took the elevator down, they smashed the feces and the smell was just horrendous. So if Conley was telling the truth that later that day he used the elevator to take the Fagan body down, the feces would have already been smashed, but they weren't. So this and the murder notes, the writing in the murder notes, proved to Governor Slayton that they probably had convicted the wrong man and that he at least needed his sentence commuted. Well, they, the defense didn't ask for a commutate. They didn't ask for a. Um, they only wanted the sentence commuted. They because they didn't feel that they could actually have him exonerated. They wanted the sentence commuted from death to life in prison, so that they would at least have a chance for further investigation and to get Frank out. So he decides to commute his sentence from death to life in prison, and the reason. And while he's doing that, uh, while he's working on his decision, Filling John Carson writes this famous um, ballad called The Little, Little Mary Fagan, which is very, very anti-Leo Frank. And it was sung by, very, by famous um, balladeers well up into the 1930s. Governor Slayton is... Um, Body is hung in effigy by a crowd that starts to storm his, the governor's mansion. And it is still the only time in American history that a sitting governor needed to call out the National Guard for his own defense. And you can see it made national news. And so what do you do about Leo Frank? I mean, they're so worried that the mob is going to storm the prison. Um, Oh, and, and, and the crowds and the, and the mob was, was so frightening that a lot of Adla Jewish Atlantans left the South, left Atlanta never to return. One of them was this man by the name of Sam Borstein, um, who was one of Leo Frank's, all, a young attorney also working on the appeal phase. And I love this photograph, and the reason I included it in the PowerPoint is because his son Daniel, that little baby sitting right there, eventually becomes Daniel Borstein, the Librarian of Congress. So it's kind of a neat... Um, bit of trivia. Jews in the South will be right back. But they take Leo Frank out at night. The sheriff, who had gotten pretty close to Leo Frank, 
at night on the train, when no one knows he's leaving, they scurry him out of Atlanta and take him to the state prison farm in Milledgeville. So now we get to the conspiracy, the lynching. Um, the most elite members of Marietta society, and you can see this was a judge. Herbert Clay was the attorney for the Blue Ridge Circuit. Former Governor Joseph Brown, who was governor of the state of Georgia during the Civil War. They conspire with a number of others. Brumby from Brumby Rocker um, fame is one of the families. Um, they conspire to carry out the sentence they feel that the state of Georgia failed to carry out. So um, they have something on the state prison and parole board. There was a typhus epidemic at the, at the state farm, and the state prison board covered it up. And they knew that if they exposed them, they would all lose their jobs. So the prison board agreed to let the conspirators into the prison and take Frank out, and no shots were fired. This is a postcard of the men's dormitory at Milledgeville. And the prisoners at that time were not kept in individual cells. They were kept in either a man, in, in the men's dormitory or a women's dormitory. And um, on the night of uh, July 17th, a fellow prisoner by the name of William Crean decides he's going to take the law into his own hands. And he steals a butcher knife from the kitchen at the um, prison farm and slices into Frank's throat. Um, he nicks the carotid artery, and the only reason Frank survives is because two individuals also in the dormitory were doctors, uh, prisoners, and they were able to stop the bleeding and they save his life. So now the conspirators are waiting. They decide, well, if he doesn't make it, our job's done. If he does make it, we'll carry out our plan. Lucille Seelig goes there and tries to nurse him back to health. He, he is very optimistic. The Bremen has a number of letters in the, in the collection, in the archives. Um, Frank wrote during this time period saying, I think the truth will will out finally. I'm very optimistic. I'm very happy. I survived. It's God's providence because I survived the, the knife slashing. But um, as you can see, on the morning of August 17th, he is lynched. Um, the New York Times publishes its last bit of news about the lynching on August 18th because um, I'm going to see if I can read it. Uh, it's very difficult. The conditions here in Georgia are depressing. A number of Jewish people in smaller towns in the state have been boycotted and have been ordered to leave and go elsewhere. A good number of such incidents all over the state are being reported. Tell Mr. Ox, and this is this is probably the most important piece of history we found during our years of research into the Frank case. It's, it's a letter written by, Ada, by a Mrs. Victor Kriegshaber to her good friend, who was Adolph Ox's niece, because she wants the publisher of the New York Times to stop putting anything else in the press because the Jewish community in Atlanta is too afraid. And it says, um, it will only make it much worse, harder for the Jews of this state to have outside forces at work. We Jews, a mere handful in a community of prejudiced lawbreakers, cannot do a thing without making it harder for ourselves. We are hoping that this outrageous conduct will be over. The Jews had a meeting of 100 prominent men at the club the other day, and they agree that there is nothing that they can do without inviting aggravating conditions. And that is the most important statement right there. We always knew that the Jewish community did nothing after the case. They went underground. No one ran for political office anymore. They, they kept such a low profile. But we didn't know until we found this letter that it was a consensus, that 100 of the most prominent individuals in the community actually met and they must have met at the Standard Club because it said the club, met and decided, we have to be quiet. We're not going to make waves. We're not going to do anything. And I know people to this day, descendants of people who were alive during the Frank case, who never heard about the case until they went away to school. Uh, someone who on our board went to Cornell University. His family owned Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill, and he went up to Fulton. Cornell and someone said, oh, you're from that place that lynched Leo Frank. He goes, who's Leo Frank? Because no one talked about it. Lucille Selig's niece, who 
ended up giving us some things for our collection, lived with her aunt. All she knew was that her uncle died young. She was away in college before she t was told that he was murdered and what had happened to him during this trial. So it was a subject that was not raised. And, and that's what the aftermath is really all about. What, what did we learn from the case? Um, this, in the Augusta Chronicle, this is another um, courageous individual, one of the few um, who the publisher of the Augusta Chronicle came out in favor of Frank, but he also destroyed his career as a publisher. Um, Governor Slayton, this is a, um, a letter that was found in um, papers that were given to us by the grandson of Slayton's secretary at the time. And it is a letter, a letter that was intercepted about a plan to kill Governor Slayton. And then what happens afterwards? The Jewish community goes underground. They don't talk about it. They're afraid. Their, their whole sense of feeling of belonging within the Atlanta greater community has changed. The Ku Klux Klan rein, reinvigorates themselves or reinvents themselves on Stone Mountain in 1915, and the original group is called the Knights of Mary Fagan. The Birth of a Nation, uh, D.W. Griffith's uh, book that the Klansmen, the, well, the book The Klansmen is turned into a movie by D.W. Griffiths, The Birth of a Nation, and it's shown on Thanksgiving Day in Atlanta in 1915, 25,000 hooded Klansmen marched through the streets of Atlanta. And in 1913, it had nothing to, the, their, their, the original charter had nothing to do with the Frank case, but the Anti-Defamation League of the B'nai B'rith was established. But by 1915, the Frank case becomes its cause celeb and its membership increases, and it still is an outspoken advocate for um, the downtrodden to this day. And finally, in 1982, um, Alonzo Mann came forward. He was the office boy at the National Pencil Company when Leo Frank was, um, when Mary Fagan was murdered, and he came forward. He, came, he tried to tell his story a number of times before, but no one believed him. Now he was near death, and he, he had to get it off his chest. So he walks into the office of the Tennessean in Nashville and tells the story that he saw Jim Conley carrying Mary Fagan's body, and that um, he, Jim Conley told him that if he said anything, he would kill him. So Lonzo Mann goes home to, and tells his mother, and because he knows he's going to be called to testify eventually. And his mother says, if they ask you that question, you have to tell the truth. But if they don't ask you, you don't have to say anything. So he never says anything. And But in retrospect, would it have changed anything? Probably not, because Jim Conley always admitted to carrying Mary Fagan's body. So it wouldn't have proven that he was not guilt, it wouldn't have done really anything to change the outcome of the case. But what it did was that it inspired the Atlanta Jewish community to come forward and try to win a posthumous pardon for Leo Frank. They did so in 1983, and the first appeal was denied, and they did so again in 1986, and it was approved. But the appeal did not, question, did not address the question of guilt or innocence. That's a copy of the pardon. Um, it only said that the state of Georgia, because of the conspiracy, failed to protect Leo Frank. And remember the five C's of the Frank case. The con you have to remember the context that the case was tried in, the importance of the newspaper coverage. The, the newspapers had such an impact on the outcome of what happened to Leo Frank, including Tom Watson's paper, The Jeffersonian. The courage of key individuals like William Smith and Governor Slayton. The conspiracy, which was really um, the first time there was a conspiracy to lynch somebody that we know of, and then of course the courts that, that really failed to protect Leo Frank in the end, but the importance of Justice Holmes' defense, which is still used today, um, his um, opinion about the fact that Leo Frank was denied due process. One of the appeals they tried to base um, for Leo Frank on was that it was discovered by one of the investigators, oh, by William Burns, that Conley, while he was in prison, was writing love letters to his girlfriend, Annie Maud Carter. Annie Maud Carter, and in the letters, he describes the exact kind of 
sexual activity that he preferred and what was perpetrated on Mary Fagan. And that was his preferred <coughs> way. And, and they tried to use the letters as a basis for one of the appeals. But, oh, and he also, in one of the letters, admits to Annie Maud Carter that he killed Mary Fagan. But the courts decide that the letters for the, are too um, sensational, too lurid, and they won't let them be admitted as evidence. So the letters never, and those letters, there are copies of those letters, but the originals are also gone. And, and that's what's so troubling about the whole case is that so much has disappeared. The transcript, we have the, at the Bremen, because we ended up getting um, Henry Alexander's papers, he was one of the attorneys, we had unbelievable court records. We had all the brief of evidence, all of the appeals, everything. But the original trial transcript has long since disappeared, and everybody has tried to find it. Also disappeared is the autopsy of Mary Fagan, and she was autopsied three times. The original autopsy, and she was exhumed twice. Today, she had teeth marks all over her body. Today, with forensics, if we had the autopsy, we could finally definitively tell who actually committed the crime because of the, the mouth size, just by you know, the pictures of what they had. Oh, and there were dental records at the time. Everything is gone. Now, there's been theories about what happened, and most people kind of think that it was the Dorsey family that got rid of everything at a certain point in time. Because up until the 50s, I believe, the trial transcript still existed. But it's, I mean, if it's out there anywhere, people have looked, I've looked, Steve only looked, um, and it's just disappeared. So Conley ends up going to the, going to, um, the jail, a work, a work farm for like a year on misdemeanor charge. And then he gets out. He's in the paper every now and then for years, uh, well into the 40s, because Henry Alexander follows him in the newspapers. He, he, every time there's a article about Conley, he clips it. And we have it as part of Henry Alexander's papers. But then he just drops off the face of the earth. And we've had so many people try to find out when Conley died, when where he was buried. And the Jewish Genealogical Society and the African American Genealogical Society decided to do a joint project to try to find Conley where he's buried, and they came up with nothing. <laughs> <laughs>